The information and opinions presented in this podcast are based on research done at a particular point in time. The fields of medicine, surgery, psychology, etc. are constantly evolving as new studies and movements happen. Please take into account the year of any particular episode's publication, and as new information presents itself, we will do our best to release updated episodes on the topics. Listener discretion is advised for references to medical terminology of body parts. Unless otherwise stated, no one speaking on this podcast is a medical or legal professional and cannot provide medical or legal advice. Welcome to the Trans Field Guide. So welcome back on the show. Thanks. It's great to be back. Today we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about the importance of inclusive language in church services and where to include inclusive language in church services. Okay. Sounds good. So I guess let's start off with why should we include inclusive language in church services? What's the whole thing about that? Well, I mean, should we define what it means to have inclusive language? What does that mean when we talk about having inclusive language? Because that means different things to different people. Yeah, and that would also tie into where do we include inclusive language? So I think it's important that churches have inclusive language because what how we talk about the things of faith impacts how people feel about divinity. So if, for example, all we use is masculine language around God, then a lot of people might leave out the feminine aspects of God. Um, They may feel that um, God is more of a God of power and justice and that sort of thing, which is certainly true of God. But also they would leave out um, the nurturing aspects of God and the, the loving parts and the caring parts of God. There have even been some scholars that have say, uh, said that the reason that the Catholic Church put uh, Mary in such a prominent position was to put the feminine back into the faith uh, because it had kind of gotten lost by using so much masculine language. I don't know if that's true or not, but that is that is something some scholars have said. So along those lines, do you think that inclusive language needs to be specific to the divine, so to say, or is it adequate if a church uses inclusive language specifically for referencing the congregates, but not necessarily for God? Mm. Yeah, I see where you're going with that. So to me, um, the reason I stated it the way that I did is because a lot of people don't understand that there are theological reasons why we want to have inclusive language, um, that we want to see God as bigger, not smaller. We want to expand that understanding of God. And really, when we confine God to masculine or feminine, we're leaving out even, even doing that. We're leaving out aspects of God that maybe aren't related to either Um, and, but yes, I think when we use, we should use inclusive language in all of church life, I believe, because, um, I I can remember being quite young and being at a Boy Scout meeting. This is not church, but still kind of the same thing. And they said something to the young Boy Scouts about the moms need to bring a dish for the next meal. Well, in my house, my dad cooked more than my, my mom. So it was a very sexist thing to say um, and to assume that only the moms could cook and maybe some moms aren't very good cooks. Um, And maybe it was a household that had two moms, which mom was supposed to cook, or maybe they had two dads who was then supposed to cook. Um, And so, you know, that's uh, when we refer to congregants by using that uh, very binary language then we're leaving out congregants who are in different configurations of family or who might have non-binary members um, by using language that excludes some people. Then that makes them feel like they're not a part of the community of faith, and it also makes them feel that God is exclusivistic instead of inclusive. At least that's the way I look at it. I mean, it's hard because, you know, a lot of churches have for years been very specific about their binary language. There are men's retreats and there are women's retreats. Instead of having, let's have a a retreat about faith 
and anybody who wants to come can come instead of having a, you know, are, are, are the women's needs that specific that they need to be inclusive of only women? Or what about uh, a men's retreat? Does a men need, do men need special treatment in order to understand things? You know, that, I don't know. It, it, it seems that when you leave one group of people out, then you're leaving out the knowledge that that group has. And you're leaving out people that maybe don't feel like they belong in either one. I know that for some congregates in some churches, they do enjoy having specifically an all men's or all women's retreat because it gives them a bit of a break from their spouse and gives them the opportunity to interact with people that have more of a similar life path to them. So, you know, you have some women congregates who enjoy having a break from their husbands to go spend time with other women and vice versa. You have male congregates who enjoy getting a break from their wives to spend time with other men from the congregation. So perhaps instead of, say, getting rid of the men's retreat and the women's retreat, perhaps keeping both and then adding an additional one that is co-ed. Right. And I'm not saying that we necessarily would not want to have a men's or women's retreat. But if you think about what you just said about women being away from their husbands, well, what if there's two women in a couple? Then who's getting away from whom there? Uh, or in the case of two men in a relationship. Um, and if you have trans people in your congregation, then which retreat do they go to? <laughs> If you're non-binary, which retreat do you go to? So I'm not I, I, I'm not saying that there's not a place for that, but I think it's complicated when you start saying things like that. And, I, you know, for some people, it doesn't feel like worship if they don't call God Father or if they don't refer to Jesus as he. Um, and for them, their faith is very much wrapped around seeing God in a particular way. I don't know what you would say, a particular gender. But the thing is, is that whenever you want to make your preference fit everybody else, that seems a little like, are we here to get what we need or are we here to reach out to other people? Just what is the purpose of us gathering here? And it could be that in some situations we could be more exclusivistic because it's a, a more internal thing and maybe it's just for those people. But whenever we're talking about corporate worship, which is worship that's open to the public, then we have to really think about how the use of Father or Lord or things like that would affect the people that hear it. You know, if your relationship with your father was abusive, how is seeing God as father going to be? Imp and for that matter, the opposite could be true as well. Seeing God as mother could be complicated for somebody who had a, uh, had a, an abusive mother. You know, seeing using Lord as language could be difficult for those whose background was from the South and the slave times. So... I think it's really important that we make people feel like the church is somewhere they want to be and that they see them see God as somebody that they can approach rather than somebody to be afraid of. Um, so that's why it's really important, I think, to use inclusive language as much as you can. It is complicated and it makes it hard for some people to feel like they're worshiping, but I do think it's important. And that ties into the concept that it's easier to get those changes made in your individual church rather than trying to get those changes made at the top. I was having a conversation about that with my mom, and we both brought up the idea that the majority of religious dogma, regardless of religion or denomination, is entrenched in tradition. And especially if it's an older church that's very well established, it becomes very difficult to get them to change something that is tradition. Yes, it is. And um, a lot of th one of the things that I learned in seminary is different denominations rely differently on how much of their practices are related to tradition as opposed to what's in the Bible, as opposed to their own experience. And... Um, for example, the Catholic Church is almost entirely based on tradition, um, and they do use um, specific language 
even to the point of calling their priest's father. Um, and so trying to get a church that has been steeped in that to change is going to be very difficult. In fact, I think you're probably not going to get it to change in in most mainline churches, especially those who are not accepting of LGBTQ people. They're less likely to change the language. But even in some, like, you know, my denomination is Disciples of Christ, and even though um, some disciples churches are not accepting of LGBTQ people as a denomination, they have been slowly changing the language. Um, the, the Bible we use is the, as the new revised standard version. Um, and that version of the Bible replaces words that used to be like brother with people or brothers and sisters or men and women. When it used to say just men, a lot of the hymns have been changed that way. And, you know, it's, we do have faith of our fathers, but then the next verse is faith of our mothers. Um, so there has been a push for that, that includes the language in the disciples, but, um, in some churches, there's just not been a push at all. Are some newer um, church starts in certain denominations are more likely to have inclusive language than some of the older, more established churches within that denomination. Um, even Disciples Church to Disciples Church, you're going to find quite a difference. There are churches today that are in East Texas that still don't have any women elders. Whereas that is something that is something we do encourage in disciples congregations. But there are still churches that don't have them, don't have women pastors. The pendulum swings slowly, as we say. <laughs> yes, especially with those older churches. And there are newer churches and denominations that are always cropping up. And even the non-denominational churches where the service could be completely different from one church to the next because they don't have those long-standing traditions to abide by. I know that another counterpoint on the topic of changing the language of the service is this. As church leaders, it could be seen as the needs of the many versus the needs of the few because the need of having inclusive language may only directly benefit a small percentage of the congregation, depending on who their congregation is made up of. I know there are some that are predominantly LGBTQ+, and others that are predominantly cishet. So as an example, let's say that we have an old church that is almost entirely cishet, their church leaders may decide that having to make the congregation as a whole change all of their habits to affect less than 10% of the congregation's inclusivity. Let's say that we have maybe five people out of a congregation of 100 that feel excluded because of the language that we're using. Well, why should we make 95 people uncomfortable while they try to change their habits in order to make five people comfortable? I think that's a good point. Um, however, I guess I'm kind of looking at how Jesus did things. And Jesus tended to be looking after the five instead of the 95. To leave the hundred sheep to go after the one law, the 99 to go after the one lost sheep. Um, to talk to the tax collectors and the people and I'm kind of feeling like making other people uncomfortable is a good thing. And the reason I say that is because it feels comfortable for those 95 people. And that doesn't challenge them. And I think that challenging them is part of what the church is about. Um, that was something I was taught in seminary is that it's a pastor's job to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and so by becoming inclusive, we comfort the five who are afflicted and we afflict the 95 comfortable. And I think that's what we're trained to do. I'm not saying like you just go up to the pulpit one day and go, so tomorrow, next Sunday, when you come, all of this is going to be changed. That's really hard to do to a group of people that are not going to now feel like they're worshiping because everything has changed. I think it's easier to change a few things at a time. So you have a 95 year old elder who prays at the table and uses father every five seconds. Let him keep doing that. 
but maybe get a 35-year-old elder on the elder board and also let that 35-year-old elder pre, you know, say the prayers. Um, if you want to introduce songs that don't have exclusivistic language, instead of changing the old songs, which is going to, if you're going to, I'm going to be real honest with you, it's going to piss off the old people to say it that way. Um, instead of doing that, maybe introduce new songs that have some different language in it and include it alongside the old ones and gradually get them used to this new language. Um, and I think that that is important to do, not just for those five people, but that helps the 95 people see that God's not just father and God is not just Lord that God can also be mother and God can also be spirit and God can also be for those other five people and not just for them. It's a lot of faith tends to be about us over here versus them over there. And I think when we use inclusive language, we're saying it belongs to everybody. I would argue that even if a hundred percent of the people in your congregation was more comfortable with father and Lord and master, that is still a good idea to start to slowly change that language to help people see God in new ways. Because none of us have a complete picture of who God is. I know that you've probably heard the old story about the, the, the five blind people filling the elephant. Oh, you haven't. <laughs> I'm seeing a puzzled look on your face. Well, and I may not be saying the story correct, but it goes something along the lines of, Five blind men were touching an elephant and trying to describe to other people what an elephant was like. And one person said, one blind man who was touching the elephant's side said, an elephant is rough and big. And the one who was feeling the tail said, no, the elephant is fluffy and small. And then another one said, no, who was touching the elephant's nose, was saying, no, the elephant is agile. And, and none of them had a complete picture of what the elephant was like because they were only seeing their part with their hands. And I think we're all like that with God. We're touching different parts of who God is, and none of us touches God completely. And so how could we ever say we know everything about what God is like? If, if, God, if God was easy to describe, the Bible wouldn't be so big. And there are parts of the Bible that describe God as being like, you know, Jesus says that um, he describes Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, would that you were like my chicks and I could gather you to me like a hen does to her chicks. And it's basically a very motherly image that Jesus is using, who at the time was here on earth as a, as a male. Um, there are places where God is referred to as wisdom and spirit and wind and fire and door and gate. And there are so many different images for God. And why should we want to confine God to that one little box of mail? But I think sometimes people who use inclusive, who do use inclusive language, forget to include the things we used to include. It's like what we used to say, let's throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we do need to keep remembering that God does encompass the masculine or what we call masculine, because that's societal anyway, um, aspects of God, that God is a God of justice and that God is a God of power and all of those things too, that we can't neglect to see God in all of the aspects that we can. And also, by saying that, and this is a point of contingency between, like, all Christians everywhere in the entire world, nobody can agree on it. Oh yeah, you'll probably get, like, letters after this. Oh yeah. <laughs> emails. <laughs> I welcome the emails. Come challenge me. Part of the reason why nobody can agree on what God is, who God is, is because that's a very personal thing to decide yes 
because no two people have the exact same relationship with God. No two people can have the exact same relationship with God. Right. Because no two people have the exact same walk of life. And so you really, through your worship, you project onto God what you need at that point in your time, in your life. Maybe you need a strong, powerful, fatherly figure in your life at that point point in time and then maybe a few years down the line you need a more soft motherly figure who is gentle and, and just like hold you to her bosom and just be like it's going to be okay both of which are very powerful imagery both of which are very protective imagery but have a different flavor to them yes and for some people they need god to be neither they need god to be more just a amorphous force in the universe um, yeah. that doesn't have a face, doesn't have a voice, is just a part of the experience of the universe. And we don't talk about that in church services so much. We don't... Only on Pentecost. <laughs> We talk about the spirit. <laughs> yes. But that's really the only time. You don't yeah. have... Um, or an epiphany. <laughs> we, we don't have where it's like, okay, and in today's, in today's worship service, uh, this congregate's going to come up, and they're just going to talk about their relationship with God and who they think God is. Everything right. is always very much like... Um, Here's a random anecdote about God, and now we're going to read some scripture. Yeah, kind of. Or this is what I read in this scripture, and so you should all see it this way. Or, yeah. or here's a way to look at it. What do you think? Depending on the preacher. Yeah. yeah. It's like here. That's the way I tend to preach. Here's <laughs> what I see. What do you think? Yeah. And we get and and again like very rarely are you going to have two different preachers who are going to have the exact same interpretation of the Bible. Oh, I can take the, the shortest scripture in the Bible, which is Jesus wept, and I could preach five sermons on it. Completely different. Because that story, Jesus wept, is about when he comes back, they had called for him because Lazarus was dying. And when he gets there, Lazarus had died. And so Martha's coming up and she's all mad. Like, if you'd been here, he'd have been saved, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus is like, well, I came as soon as I could, blah, blah, blah. Then Mary came up and was like, you weren't here. And it touched his heart and he cried. So I could preach a sermon on how Jesus sympathized or empathized with Mary and how Jesus empathizes with us when we're hurting. Or I could do this as a sermon based on Jesus' power and how he raised Lazarus from the dead. Or I could write a sermon on the differences between Martha and Mary. I, You know, there are so many, or why did he delay? Is it because he knew what his power was going to do? Was he trying to prove who he was? There's a whole nother sermon. And that's the shortest scripture in the Bible. And I've just told you four different things, ways of looking at it. And all of those ways, I believe, they're just different ways of looking at that story in different sermons that could be preached but i can throw an even bigger wrench in what you said about how different people may see god in different ways depending on the part of their life i had a minister tell me one time and i don't know how many of people who are going to be listening to this know about the myers-briggs personality tests but the two middle letters of your myers-briggs letters encompass four different distinct personality styles the sf the st the NF and the NT. And each of those four see God in a different way. So STs take real information through their senses and think it through. That's ST. STs tend to see God as a lawgiver and as the father who brings justice. The SFs take in real information and feel their way through. So they are very touchy-feely people and they see God as Jesus, their friend. And T's take in information that's kind of out there. You can't really pinpoint it, but they think it through logically. 
and they see Jesus as a person who brings justice and who is and they're, they're like the you know ju- made justice roll down like mountains these are the people like Martin Luther King Jr that are trying to change the world like they think Jesus did right and then you have the NFs who take in information from some nebulous out there right feel their way through it so they're just like it's all loosey goosey uh, and they see God as a giant mystery that could never really be solved. And that's their personality style. And everybody I've ever asked that question of who knows their Myers-Briggs are like, that's pretty accurate. So I know it is for me. I'm an SF and I see Jesus as my friend. Like this episode? Tell someone about it. Have any questions or concerns? Please feel free to send an email to transfieldguide at gmail.com. Also be sure to subscribe to keep up with the latest episodes. Stay safe and remember, I'm proud of you.